Welcome back, fellow Jazz Bums. Today we have uh, another interview. Uh, we are super excited to talk to Mike Esposito, uh, owner of the InGroove. Um, so thank you, Mike, for being here. Um, before we get started, remember to like and subscribe. We're going to drop links to uh, Mike's social media channels in the description, so make sure to check out those as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to kick it over to Felipe to get us started. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Mike, again, for You're coming welcome. and joining us today. Thanks so much for, 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 for being there. So today we have Mike, Mike Esposito. Um, not many big introductions needed. He's a widely uh, well-known figure in the record collecting music uh, um, groups everywhere, internet, in the streets, everybody. Uh, he runs the InGroove store, has a very big uh, website, really well known as a real known figure on YouTube and many other channels, record collector, audiophile, and so on. So, Mike, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and I hope we have a, a nice conversation. My first interview. I've never been interviewed before, so we'll right. see how it goes. <laughs> Let's see how it goes, yes. So, just to kick in... Um, just to give a little more background, I think people uh, might be curious. I was living in Tampa Bay for the last six years. I know you come from that area. Uh, now I'm back here in South Florida. So just to make this connection, how from Tampa Bay to Arizona and, and being such a successful business owner, record collector, tell us a little bit of, of what went in between there. How did I move from Tampa to... Yes, and, and get into the music, how music can get in your life, you know, um, why, why, why music, yeah. So, I don't know, you know, my father wasn't really overly musical. Uh, you know, I remember driving around uh, the Bay Area in his 77 Buick LeSabre, and we would just listen to the oldies station. He wasn't overly musical. He had a couple of CDs, maybe 10 or 15 CDs. He didn't. He had a box of records that he'd never let me play because he felt that they would damage his stereo if, you know, something popped. I think he thought a woofer was going to explode or something. So we never touched his vinyl. But I remember actually the time I got the bug was he had a friend and we were over his house and he had a pair of Macintosh MC 2300s, the Macintosh line array speakers, the XR, X, X, XRT 18s. I remember hearing that for the first time. I might have been like nine or 10 years old, and that just blew my mind. It was like nothing I had ever heard up till that point. And I mean, it was a decade till I heard anything that good again. But maybe that got me going. But with my father, I was never really musical. Uh, I had a friend. I was listening to oldies, stuff that he had listened to. But I had a friend when I was maybe 11 or 12 maybe years old. And he's like, you got to hear the CD I got. I got this new CD. And it was the Doors in concert. And that just blew my mind. And that was kind of my transition from my father's and my parents' music to figuring out and discovering what I like personally. So, I mean, that's kind of where it took place from the start. And then, I mean, I would, I come from a very poor family. So I couldn't afford CDs. You know, CDs growing up were like 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. the, the thought of a CD was like, psh, <laughs> That wasn't yeah, happening. Same for, but, same for me. Yeah, growing up in Florida, though, there's flea markets and there's, you find vinyl was everywhere and it was abundantly cheap and you could just get it for nothing. So really that was like my only means of listening to music. You know what I mean? Was It was an affordable way. I mean, that and short of sitting on the radio station with my record, my finger over the record button on the cassette, you know what I mean? On the cassette tape. So a song comes on that I wanted to record, I could quickly record it. But for the most part, to own a piece of music, vinyl was the only affordable way to do it. So that kind of got me going earlier on with hunting down and finding records that I wanted to listen, music that I wanted, but it was always on the vinyl format, just for cost reasons. Now, how, how like uh, focused were you at collecting? Was it like, uh, like were, were you completely obsessed with it right off the bat? Or was it a kind of a slow interest that grew? I mean, I never thought of it as an obsession, although it was something I did very often. I mean, I would go to record stores with my girlfriend and I bought, she would buy a lot of 45s. I would buy LPs. 
I buy 45s as well. But at that point in time, it was really me exploring music because it was kind of like pre, like right before the internet. I mean, there was the internet, but you'd have to go to like, we would go to the library. So I find something musically I would like. And then I remember going to the library and downloading lyrics. I mean, so the internet was kind of just about getting going and it was kind of a way to discover. So as I was discovering music, it it was just, for me, it was buying to discover and listen to music. It really wasn't a collection at that point in time. Now, did you do any swapping back then or trades or, you know, to to get more stuff? No, not really. Because... I was at that point in time, you know, being a teenager and I was listening to at that point kind of music that nobody else was listening to. I was a fan of like the Doors and Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin. And this is in high school and everybody else at the time was Nirvana, Pearl Mm -hmm. Jam, you know, all the 90s stuff. And at that time, I didn't like it. You know, I kind of was not a fan. Since then, I've gone back to it and started appreciating it. But at that time, I wasn't musically on the same page with really many people growing Uh, up just going back to your father i've heard you speak about um that he was a huge elvis guy yeah is that right so actually i guess i did get my love of elvis from him yeah and i i've always kind of related to that this is kind of an aside but i have a like obsession with frank sinatra and you know it's he's not really that popular with record collectors like his his stuff is generally cheap and it's easy to get and they don't reissue it too often and I was just wondering with uh, with Elvis, it seems like there's a similarity there um, in terms of, you know, his records haven't been like over the past few decades that that pricey and costly. Do you have Elvis in your collection and are there like gems that you would recommend um, and that you kind of go back to? I have tons of Elvis in my collection. I mean, I've got records that I remember when I was hunting down and going to these record stores like some of the uh, the holy grails at that time were the buddy holly crickets the elvis first record i mean those records were just unobtainium they were in the 90s it was like a thousand bucks for some of those it was just and that was an insane amount of money Mm -hmm. uh even now it's expensive but back then (laughs) that was a ridiculous sum of money but since then i've gone back and i've gotten all those records but it's funny you mentioned Frank Sinatra because that brings up memories for me. So I didn't have a ton of family growing up. I had my grandmother, my father's mother, and then I had my father. My grandmother had a love of Frank Sinatra, and that's where I got my love for Frank Sinatra. My father had Elvis. And although growing up, I kind of started finding my own musical taste, those two always kind of stuck with me. My grandmother had like a really high-end cassette deck, but she only had one tape, and it was Frank Sinatra's That's Life. And I remember if I wanted to ever listen to music at my grandmother's house, that was it. It was that cassette tape of Frank Sinatra's That's Life. And I probably have heard that, no exaggeration, a thousand times. The tape eventually wore out and broke. So then there was no more uh, no more tapes. But uh, going back, I, you know, I kind of stopped collecting for a point in time, raised a family, got a career, had kid, had a kid. Uh, going back to it, that's kind of where I started picking up things from my childhood that were never even, that it never was something I even thought I could obtain, you know, those Elvis records and that kind of stuff. Do you still have any of the records you had from your first collection as a kid? Yes. That's cool. It's, uh, it's pretty bad stuff. It's pretty, yeah. pretty rushed out. It's sad. <laughs> well, it's sad because at the time, <laughs> I was collecting all the stuff I shouldn't have been. So mm-hmm. I wanted to buy Elvis and Beatles records in the 90s. It was like the worst time ever to buy Elvis and Beatles records. Like now, yeah. it's sad, but half of the Elvis records that come into my store are like in the dollar bin. But yeah. at the time, it was, you know, uh, Moody Blue was a wall record when I was a kid. Oh, this is on blue vinyl. And, you know, I mean, it would be a $30 record on somebody's wall. So I was collecting a lot of the stuff that I really shouldn't have been collecting. But, and it was never in good shape it's kind of funny when i think back on the way you used to collect things versus the way people collect things now you kind of just got what you could get because there wasn't things weren't happening on the internet Uh, i grew up in a town that i mean it was flea markets and that kind of stuff there really was kind of a boot used record store bookstore but you kind of got what you got uh 
regardless of condition pressing. I mean, it wasn't something you really thought of for the right. most part. I mean, there was always certain things that people knew. Everybody knew if you got a blue triangle, dark side of the moon, you had an expensive and rare record. If you had the cricket with the textured cover, that was the one, you know, but for the most part, you kind of got what you got in the condition you got it in. And it's funny. I don't even, those original records, actually, they sit in a box in my laundry room. It's like, I, they should, I should be more sentimentally attached to them, but it's like the worst condition the worst guy. It's just they're just bad records. Yeah, I inherited my dad's few records, like a cube's worth of his records, you know. And it had some of this stuff from my childhood, like my original mm -hmm. thriller from when I was six years old, you know. And it's beat the shit, but it, that one was kind of special. But the rest of it, you know, there's probably five or ten records I remember him playing that I care about. But man, he bought some cheap shit. There's so many of those like 60s, 70s, like hit comps. Mm hmm. You know, like like just a level above KTEL, maybe you know. Well, that was my father's collection. Like his favorite record was Elvis's Double Dynamite, which was like a maybe a Roncor as seen on TV compilation yeah. for Elvis, and right. it just sounds horrible. It was like fifteen <laughs> an obscene amount of tracks per every side. So that's the kind of stuff I got as well. Yeah, and they they fade out halfway through the song because uh, you just only a piece of it, you know. Yeah, I've got a bunch so of that stuff. That's funny. They're so bad. So. <laughs> When did jazz come into the picture for you? Maybe 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, 15, 18, 20 years. I mean, it's been a while. Yeah. But kind of right when I started getting back into collecting records, okay. I was in a record store and I had, I, I mean, they had Miles Davis sketches of Spain playing. And I think it was a classic records issue. Maybe it was a classic records. I, classic was really just going strong at that point in time. And I didn't really care for sketches of Spain. And to this day, I really don't. But uh, I remember, I feel like I kind of asked, you know, maybe I should, which I remember asking the guy, like, do you have something maybe you can help me? I'd like to maybe try to explore jazz a little bit. Is there anything? Because I went into it essentially thinking my whole life jazz was uh, Kenny G playing elevator music. And I think that's to this day, the biggest problem jazz has is it's the biggest obstacle for people is, it's like forever associated with smooth jazz. So for me, it was like, I kind of would go into the record store and I would hear different things. So I kind of was getting a sense that there is, what's this other jazz? So, and I was turned on to Art Blakey's Monin. Yeah. And I took that home and I played it and that just blew my mind. It was, yeah, you know, and it's the same way people get into records now. If I put them onto a record and they like it, they did the they do the exact same thing that I did is they come back and they're like, This was amazing. What else is like this? And mm -hmm. then they just go crazy. And that's that was that's what did it for me. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 interesting because the same thing happened with me because of you. Like mm -hmm. I got back into records during the pandemic. I was buying a bunch of you know classic rock and stuff like that, found your channel, and you kept started talking about the tone poets, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm looking for records in my store and I see bass on top with cool cover. I recognize this tone, but I was like, Mike said, these are good. So I bought that, and then I've spent all my money ever since then on jazz records, pretty much. But So yeah, I mean, you know, I've only been listening since since then, but it's just been an incredible journey, and it's basically all I really listen to anymore, pretty much I, all three I think one of the coolest things that I've been able to do through YouTube is I really, truly feel, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back too much, but I feel like I've turned a lot of people on to jazz, and it has been the coolest thing to where I've curated an audience and a following of jazz fans to where I could put on a jazz record in the show store on any particular day. And many people are in the store and are familiar with it and they enjoy it. And I, I that wasn't always the case, you know, eight, nine mm -hmm. years ago, that wasn't the case when I had the store. So it's, but it, same thing was done to me. So I, I'm glad to be able to kind of push that along. Uh, and some of it's for selfish reasons, like tone poets exist because of their popularity and they continue because of their popularity. And if not, they go away. So for me, it's mm -hmm. like, I want to bring these records to people and show people these records a, because the music's great and everything, but for selfish reasons as well. I remember, I know you guys have, you're kind of newer to this, but there was a point in time when if you were an audiophile and you were a vinyl record lover, like there was no new releases. You would wait a month, two months, and it would be like, here's the audiophile record of the quarter. I mean, they just didn't exist. 
And I don't know if we ever thought they were coming back. Some people claim they did, but uh, I don't. <laughs> when I go back and think, I I don't really think anybody really truly felt that they were coming back because there was nothing at that point showing they were going to come back. It was just yeah. got progressively worse and worse. You know, a record a month turned in a record every two months. You know, it just it didn't look like it was going well. But now, the amount of stuff, it's just, it's what a wonderful time. But for selfish reasons, I want to show people these records and push people like yeah. that. Because I, it's like a snowball effect. The more people buy them and listen to them, love them, and then the incentivizes the manufacturers to do it. And we're at that point to where uh, the manufacturers are now all doing it because it's just snowballed and it's a juggernaut. Yeah, yeah. So, so Mike, in, um, in that regard, uh, so when did you kind of found yourself to say, I'm an audiophile, I care about my gear and I care about the quality of what I have and where did you start that journey? And well, second, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, finish. No, just, um, you said the vinyl is just going lower and lower and now, and then all of a sudden, where do you think was this turning point and vinyl really kicked in back? I think it was pre-COVID but do you, can you specify or think about a moment or space in time which, where records really, okay, that's the moment it's kicking in? So well, I guess I'll answer your first question. So I was always an audiophile from that time when I was nine or 10 years old listening to my father's friend stereo. And I never knew it, but I always, hearing great music is kind of a blessing and a curse because if you hear something that's truly special you'll never be able to unhear it if you hear your favorite record or you hear a record you're and actually the record we listened to was elvis's aloha from hawaii so mm -hmm. when i heard that record on his system it lived with me for the rest of my life i knew what it could sound like and i never got to hear it again but i knew it existed and it was like i don't know if i romanticized it at some point in time as the years started going by but i knew it could exist so i always longed for that particular sound and I, you know when i moved to arizona and started making money and doing things i kind of was able to purchase gear to kind of get me there but i always knew no matter what i had since that day it was never what i once heard so i kind of always was looking for better uh as far as your second question i mean things were progressively getting better uh, you know, I go back and I look at numbers or I did a once upon a time for the store and things progressively got better until before the pandemic. And, you know, it was on an uptrend, but it was really like just kind of humming mm -hmm. along. And it was the pandemic was just like a shot of it. I won't even say adrenaline. I mean, it was a shot of rocket fuel. I mean, it just set everything crazy to a crazy direction and i'll tell you a story so i start doing youtube and i mean this is early on in the pandemic to where like maybe i mean i already had the youtube channel going for a couple of years so i had a little bit of an audience so i start doing youtube and pff, i mean it was just me looking at my wife and i'm like we're sitting at the store by ourselves we go to work every day just because you know I'm a worker, and even though everyone's home, I'm like, we got to go to work. I got to think of something. <laughs> we're going to be homeless. <laughs> like, we're going to work. There's no business. I mean, we had the website. We had everything in place, and I was just chatting with my wife. Man, why don't we just go online? We've always used YouTube as kind of a uh, like an educational thing for people. Like, I never – I would say, like, hey, I got a store, but, like, that was never my focus. It was, like, just let me tell you about these pressings and what I think of them. But then there was a conversation I had with my wife and it was just, hey, uh, this ain't good. We got a problem. Uh, we need to do something. And she's like, what? And I'm like, well, what if we do like a QVC type of thing on YouTube? Like we have this record and you can buy it and you can go here to buy it. Operators are standing by. I mean, and she's like, well, nah, I don't think so. I'm like, no, nah, I think it might. I mean, it's better than nothing. So if you go back and watch some of those early videos, they were kind of very, they were just like that. And, you know, we're sitting there and then it was like the very first video. And we had like 14 orders in a day. It was like, that was a big ordeal. Because at the time, only me and Angel worked in the store. Mm -hmm. So we had to like process these 14 orders. And it was like, uh, 
it was the next week it was like 30 orders and it's like okay like now we don't have time to do anything else but this and i mean it was like within a month we were doing like 150 to 200 orders on a day you know on it and it was just me and angel and it was like it, it was insane like it was great yeah. I'm calling my friends hey you want to help me pack some boxes so we're trying uh it was tough finding employees because a lot of people were being at home still getting paid mm -hmm. whether it was unemployment or their previous employer so it was difficult i'll never forget and this is a funny story i don't think i've ever told it so i ordered 200 copies of la woman from acoustic sounds i'd been a dealer for years and my rep contact me back and they're like, is this an error? Did you mean to order 200 records? Yeah, yeah, I did. And she goes, something along the lines of Chad wants us to hold this order. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> hmm. They kind of, I think they would, I don't know what they were thinking. Maybe they, they were, you know, they were curious. Like here's a store that had been ordering a couple of records, all this, you know three, four, five copies, maybe 20 copies of a hot new release. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that conversation I had with Chad. And this was kind of like me explaining. I'm like, no, I go on YouTube and I talk about records. And <laughs> and he the conversation is ever embedded in my mind. He's like, you what? I'm like, yeah, I just tell people like, this is the new record. It's out this week. Or this is really awesome. I dig this record. You should listen to it. And we chatted for like maybe an hour and a half. And he shipped the records. And it was a very, very short amount of time uh, for where it was just business as usual to where it was a rocket ship. And I mean, it took about maybe three months after that to where I noticed that the craziness had affected the whole industry. Mm -hmm. Because at first it was fine. COVID started. I was buying records and selling tons of records and everybody had stock. But then there was like a moment in time where just everything bottlenecked. You could no longer, you can no longer acquire any of these records anymore. And it was really yeah. that June maybe of 2020. Yep. And I think you just uh, reminded me. Uh, I remember I would put in orders, um, for example, at like Acoustic Sounds, and they would ship them out the next day. And then yep. the pandemic happened, and it would take like a week and a half before I get a shipping notification because not only were there, I mean, there were bottlenecks throughout the entire chain. Like even if they could get them out. USPS or whoever couldn't even get them to, you know, they couldn't even get. Them. So um, it was it was pretty crazy. I remember that uh, that happening and just um, yeah. Well, I think it, it took a, it took us a long time to catch up with that not being reality. I think it may have taken some of the record companies the same some some time as well. Like we talked on our live stream a couple of weeks ago when you joined us about those 150 records that everybody has, you know, a billion copies of still. As buyers, it took me a long time to train my brain not to buy everything I see now. Because before, like, if a new MoFi came out, it's like, fuck, you better get it in the next 30 right. seconds, man. Quick, it's gone. Quick, yeah. It's going to sell out. I have to wait two years. Well, yeah, do you remember I, mean, I got a bunch of MoFis I don't care about because I just bought them because it was a MoFi that showed up on the website. I got that Kraft Small Batch, Yusuf. And that was like, I can't even believe I got that because afterwards it sold out within, like, 30 seconds. seconds. Uh, that was, that was like, peak... Uh, pandemic uh, FOMO buying. It's funny thinking on it, and I watch a lot of videos online, and there's so many new faces on YouTube that weren't necessarily collecting records before them. And I, it's interesting to watch how that information gets uh, processed and broadcasted out because there is so many people that are not familiar with the way things used to be. Mm -hmm. And the mentality is it's like, ah, oh, it's things are doom and gloom and it's horrible and when reality it's just going back to kind of where it was, although not, it's not even going back to where it was because there's still a huge base of people that exist now that are buying these records. Because like I said earlier, once you hear something, you can't unhear it. If you get a moderately decent system and throw a tone poet on it, you are never going to recreate that sound. Yes. Else. So you can't unhear that. So even if some X amount of people get out of it, there's so many people that are going to be in this now for the long run, because you will never be able to, forget that you just i mean do you think really that the the predicted drop-off has been exaggerated then so i remember people saying oh this is all going to go away as soon as code's over because people are going to stop buying records because they're going to be able to go do other things i mean i'm sure there was some of that but are you saying it's less of a drop-off than maybe people had anticipated no. i mean there's definitely a drop-off 
things have slowed down. People are going out and doing other things. And it seems now that bands are torn again, they're making up for lost time by charging twice of what they used to pre-COVID. Yeah. So there's definitely a lot of money being redirected elsewhere. But if a manufacturer puts out a good product, it still will sell like gangbusters. It's just a there's more of a wait and see kind of attitude because not everybody knows you can wait and see. But that's the way it always was. I remember it was like that for Santana Braxis. I wasn't thrilled about paying 100 bucks. I'm like, let me wait. Let me see. And then I got butt hurt because they wouldn't sell me one directly to the store. I was like, no, this is a uh, website only exclusive. So I got butt hurt. I'm like, I'm just not going to buy it. And then it was starting to go up. And I just said, I'm not going to do it. And then I, it was around 500 bucks. And a buddy like, let me listen to his copy. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. I'm like, I bought it that afternoon. <laughs> but for years and years and years, you had plenty of time to just wait and see. Then you had three years where you had no choice but to buy on a blind, you know, on a hope. Now we're back to that wait and see. And when there is a solid title out, people still go crazy and they'll buy it. But, you know, there's titles now that sometimes they don't do as well, as well because word gets out. Maybe it's not up to par or something of that nature. Whereas before you would sell out 9,000 or whatever it was, 6,000 Muddy Waters folk singers and not one person ever heard the record. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah. There's a trend there. Uh, I mean, so yesterday we dropped uh, our, you know, review on the the UHQR, the John Coltrane. And uh, Mm -hmm. I think because what's going on, everybody was like holding back. Should I get it? Should I not? Mm -hmm. How much better it's going to be? Should I invest that? It looks like a lot of people are waiting for some feedback from somewhere to, to, yeah. to actually go get them. Yeah. And it's funny. Mm-hmm. I kind of notice it now with the store, looking at numbers. There's kind of a pre-order announcement. Boom. Mm-hmm. A lot of people order it. Then there's a lull. And then once the record starts coming out and it starts getting talked about, and people start telling their friends and whatnot, this is good or this is not. It either continues to stagnate or there's a big uptick. And with the Coltrane, I'm noticing it kind of there's an uptick i was never worried about the coal train though because the 33 i thought was so good and i haven't heard the 45 yet but you got the same guy doing a 33 as the 45 you kind of assume that it's going to be at least as good as that or slightly better so i never really had any worry with that mm-hmm. but uh you can see that wait and see mentality working now people are waiting to get the final verdict from everybody else uh i wanted to ask do you think that the uh that in particular with jazz but you know generally too are people's tastes in jazz changing um i've noticed that like they're putting out indian navigation pharaoh uh woody shaw blackstone legacy Uh, these are different types of records from like the blue notes and the miles davises that people have been clamoring for and do you do is there kind of a a demand for other types of jazz, maybe stuff that's a little later, 60s, 70s. Um, one, do you see that? And then two, uh, in terms of your own taste, um, has your taste in jazz evolved? Are you, what are you looking for um, to add to your collection these days? So people's tastes have expanded a little bit, but it's still a slow process. The best thing that's ever happened kind of it is kind of most people's natural progression, meaning the way that these have been released and then subsequently the reissues and the way the reissues have gone kind of has followed a lot of people's uh, journey through jazz. You know, we started with very accessible, accessible uh, reissues of Blue Train and Monin and Kind of Blue, Time Out. And as the years have gone on, people have had opportunity to buy Blue Notes and like really warhorse catalog prestige titles and it seems now after three or four years of people digesting that they're starting to put up a little more adventurous stuff you know with the jazz dispensary stuff with the woody shaw title so i think it's nice because it's built an audience for audiophile jazz records and then they're kind of expanding uh the musical taste of their audience because a lot of people will buy those records just based on uh knowledge of the past you know the blue note tone poets have been so wildly successful Mm -hmm. uh they've built such credibility that they can put out something that maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with and do really well with it so i can see 
that kind of going on with other labels to where people will kind of just, uh, you know, they're reasonably priced enough to where people are willing to try something. Out. But, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, for the most part, look, they're still the best selling of these modern, I want to say the best selling modern audio file, like lower price title this year was the waltz for debbie i think i sold more waltz for debbie than anything else by a large stretch so it's still the old war horses that are selling mm-hmm. but i think other people are venturing out but it's nothing's going to sell like waltz for debbie nothing's going to sell like those titles but when i saw how well i was doing with the woody shot to be honest i was a little shocked but i guess it makes sense people are moving outwards like all of us did Oh, and as far as what I collect, so I'm very stuck in very specific. I like that 50s, 60s era bop for the most part. Uh, and I like more of the jazz, funk type of stuff from the 70s. That's kind of my main preference. Uh, I've got some stuff outside of that, but that's more or less where I'm, what I'm buying and what I'm collecting. Yeah, but you're a big fan of Alice Coltrane as well, right? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Alice Coltrane. But I kind of look at her as kind of, I mean, it's more of like spiritual jazz. But for me, some of that stuff is so rhythmic. It, to me, it kind of borderlines into soul funk. But yeah. I guess. How did the, how did the um, journey to Sachin Ananda and like the um, karma, how did those sell? Tired of the wood. Yeah, they, those mm-hmm. Token, hmm? they did really well. Did, There's yeah. always going to be a sweet spot of a title that's impossible to find, and then it comes out for the first time as an audio file record. And those were like Karma, uh, the Alice Coltrane. Those titles were just impossible to find. I mean, even like late 80s pressings, you know, when they started reissuing the Impulse catalog, they just were next to impossible to find. So there was a huge audience ready to go for mm-hmm. those. So they've done really well. And uh, I think they kind of realized how well they did. And that's kind of morphed into the verb by request series. It's a shame that I, I mean, I wish it was done in a little, you know, the acoustic sound series level, but uh, yeah. they've done well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping that Blackstone legacy sells really well. So we can get more stuff like that. We're super excited about that one. I mean, it's a $400 record. Those titles will always have just a built-in audience. There's certain titles that are just so rare that they cost a fortune that a reissue really doesn't do that well because the reason that record is so expensive is because it's so Mm -hmm. rare. But then there's titles like that Woody Shaw that they probably sold pretty okay in the era for that label and that type of music and that there's a big enough demand for it that they'll do well on its own, but there's a bigger audience now for jazz vinyl than there ever was. I really truly believe that. Well, that leads me to a question where if you look at the, like the general, um, you know, uh, population jazz really is maybe the least popular genre, but mm-hmm. then you know, I've, I've seen you do like your new arrivals video that you drop on Thursday mornings and you'll like apologize sometimes. Cause you're like, I gotta, gotta get through a lot of jazz here. Mm-hmm. And it does seem like jazz over indexes in the record community. Yes. Um, and why, why do you think that is? Why do you think record collectors like, I mean, it seems like it, it is one of the top, you know, reissued genres um, and selling and selling genres. Um, and correct me if that's wrong, but just what are your thoughts behind that? We spent like what, 25, 30 years all throughout the nineties, all throughout the O's and most of the teens listening to the, crappiest shittiest sounding music known to man cds followed by mp3s and like single song downloads so this Not was sure. this was like a generations of people listening to horrible music and then you get into records and those jazz records for an audio, from an audiophile perspective the best recordings are typically acoustic uh, mm-hmm. recordings, you know, where you don't have amplification, like a lot of those early blue notes, acoustic recordings, and then direct a two track. 
So it's like, I think part of the reason they do so well, especially on vinyl, is because you have generations of people that have heard just the worst music ever, uh, sound-wise, and then you put that on and it's like unbelievable. Those are easier to reissue, truth be told. I mean, it's going to be a lot easier to put out an Art Blakey record than it ever is going to be to put out a Led Zeppelin record. Mm, that's a good point. So yeah. there's, you know, and you're saying that because of like licensing issues and who owns yeah. the, the tapes. Yeah. So maybe Chad will tell you different. Maybe these other guys will tell you different. But if they had the ability to do like Floyd, Led Zeppelin, uh, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones catalog or like everything Blue Note and Prestige ever did, no one's going to choose the Blue Note or the Prestige. <laughs> They're going to choose the other hand. Uh, but those records were just easier to license. I mean, to where, for instance, Chad did like Bill Evans, like multiple times, just throughout decades, through the nineties, through the O's, through the teens, you know, just was able to keep doing it. So there, it, it, they were always easier to license. And now, but also audiophiles have always liked them because they're just sonically recorded better, but they were recorded better because they were easier to record. It was always easier to record four or five, uh, acoustic instruments than it would have been to record somebody like Hendrix. So there was just, I, I'm bouncing all over the place, but there's a lot of factors I think that make up that answer. What percentage yeah. of your customers do you think are, are audiophiles and are buying records because of how they sound? I'm not saying all audiophiles only listen to the records for their sound, but I mean, do you think, I don't know what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. Maybe 20, 30%. I don't have definitive numbers on that, sure. but a huge amount of my customers are just record people mm -hmm. and they like the fact that when something comes out, it's good, but there's a lot of people that are just record people. And they just, because even if you take out the audio file aspect of it all, putting on even a mediocre pressing of a particular modern record, a lot of times will net better results than streaming it on a uh, Bluetooth speaker, you know? So, and maybe people won't put two and two together and say that I'm an audio file because this is the way, but I really truly feel that, unless you're maybe just a young girl, Taylor Swift collector, you know, that very beginning collector. Uh, when you get into like putting a stereo, a turntable, a system together, and you're buying records to listen to, it's like whether you like to, whether you would like to admit it or not, you really kind of either are a collector or you're an audiophile. I feel like a lot of people are audiophiles files and just don't know it. You mm -hmm. know, they mentally don't come out and say it, but the reason they're doing this is because, there's an enjoyment, a sonic enjoyment, also a tactile enjoyment of playing mm -hmm. a record. But there's a sonic enjoyment that they don't even notice. Yeah, I mean, I've got a very modest system here in my office, which is where I listen to records all the time. But I can definitely, even with my, you know, five hundred dollar setup or whatever, I can definitely tell the difference between a shitty record and a good record. Yeah, and it's you know, it's no, if you have just any kind of decent set of speakers and a turntable. In a, in a $60 amp, you can definitely hear the difference. And I get upset when I buy something that sounds like crap. Yeah, so I, mean, I guess that makes me an audiophile, but it's, I mean, you know, I guess there is that some percentage of people out there that are, that are really more interested in how the record sounds than the music. <laughs> I feel like everybody cares, even if they don't know it, because it's funny. I had a guy come in the other day and he bought, a bunch of hip hop records. It was like Little Wayne and Tupac, and these are records that are known to be notoriously low quality. You know, I mean, they just don't put a lot of effort into those records. Mm -hmm. But he came in because they had lots of noise and lots of scratches and lots of pops, and they were warped. And he was young, and I mean, I kind of had to give him the speech. <laughs> I felt, you know, about what to expect with, you know, hip hop represses. Uh, but he cared. I mean, there are a lot of people that do care uh, because if it only takes, again, hearing that one record to know what's up, mm -hmm. you know what it's capable of. And then you put the next one on and your turntable stylus is dancing and it's popping and clicking and making all kinds of noise. You don't have to be an audiophile, but you know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking about it, although I've never given this much thought, I really think more people are audiophiles in a way than they even know or they'll even admit to you know you don't have to spend uh hundred thousand dollars on a stereo if you're conscious of the way your record sounds are used every point in time you put something on you're like well that doesn't sound as good as maybe something else did i think at that point in time you're kind of an audio file and don't know it mm -hmm. 
that makes yeah. sense. I mean, you can listen, right? Some things are too much, some things are missing. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mike, speaking of audio file and uh, releasing good records, you have been adventure. Uh, Wild Times, mm -hmm. the Cannibals now, and those those records sound excellent. Some of the best records I have in my collection. Kudos to, to you, to Kevin, to Bernie. They were like fantastic. I truly, truly liked. And now you're in a sort of a partnership, quote mm -hmm. unquote, with, with Kevin. So where did that come from? What pushes you to do that? Uh, releasing, uh, reissuing uh, records and also working with Kevin now. How did this whole thing works for you? Worked? Uh, well, I've been talking to Kevin because I bought records from him. But there was a point in time where, you know, just knowing and talking to Kevin, he was having difficulty keeping up doing this. He, you know, he masters Monday through Thursday. Friday is kind of his day to do other stuff. And, I mean, I could tell he was having difficulty getting these out because it'd be like, you know, uh, okay, got your order, Mike. I'll be able to get these out to you next Friday. Or... I'm sorry, something came up. I'm not able to get it out, but I'll get it out as soon as I can. So it's like immediately I already knew that he was having issues getting stuff out just based on conversations I had with him. Then it was kind of a combination of going. I talked about this a little bit on my live stream I did with him, but then going to Expona, going to room after room after room and not seeing it and then seeing what they were playing, what they could, and in the back of my mind knowing what they could have been playing. Uh, and then he had kind of mentioned it that he was at a show and that availability wasn't there but also knowing from my conversation that i first had with him that like look i'll sell you records but it's got to be this x amount because i just don't have time to do it any other way so it's like i knew uh i knew that maybe i could do something and i think i might have mentioned it to my wife i'm like I'm thinking about this. Do you think I'm crazy? Like, what if uh, I ask Kevin and, you know, I can distribute the records for him? And she's like, first thing out of her mouth, of course, was more work. <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, I'm like, it's minor. It's minor. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. how many extra orders? Get? No big deal. And so once I calmed her down and it's like a couple of records here and there, it's, you know, we're not shipping hundreds of wholesale orders out every day. She's like, you think that'll work? I mean, I don't know. I'll mention it to him. And I mean, I kind of just mentioned it to him. And it, we talked about it back and forth and the logistics of it. And to be honest, I never really, I don't know if I ever asked him that question thinking it was going to happen. Uh, but it was like, go, you know, it was the old saying, if you don't ask, you'll, you'll never know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I thought to myself, like, why would he want to, Salute, choose me. There's many of other people he could do it uh, with. You know, there's other yeah. online websites that specialize in their own labels and wholesaling. And why would he choose me? So, like, I, I thought that in the back of my mind, but yeah, but you step forward. Yeah, you, know, you put yourself. I, so, business. I know this is difficult, maybe impossible, but the business piece of this aside, uh, what Kevin's doing with Coherent. He's putting out a new uh, record session with uh, Anthony Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we spoke with him a little bit about that. And he was saying that he was, Anthony was like really excited about the potential of recording in this type of studio space, this all tube space. Mm -hmm. I guess just from your perspective, the potential for coherent audio, um, the sessions, the musicians that it may attract and what it's doing in the small group kind of setting it's going to kind of encourage I think from our perspective, we we are just, you know, I know, you know, there's 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 lots of planning to do, but it, it could potentially be one of, you know, a great record label for jazz and, and other stuff, too. I know he's doing a bluegrass, but perhaps. Mm -hmm. But at, from your perspective, how what in the future kind of prospects of coherent audio um, or coherent records? What 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 do you think about it? Uh funny that these things don't ever you don't ever know about them at the time blue note never was blue note in the 50s it was just some small local label trying to sell records now it's what it is so it'll definitely take decades to uh get the recognition mm. that i think 
it will get. I really truly do feel like it will get there. With him recording bigger and bigger acts, these records will kind of be iconic. It'll take decades to probably get there, but they will be iconic. They will be records that people look for years down the road uh, because I really truly feel he's going to pull in huge artists mm -hmm. of today uh, right. and he's going to make sonically spectacular records. Mm -hmm. I truly feel like there's a huge, you're limited. If you're an audiophile reissue your label, you are so limited in what you can do and what you can offer and licensing. Mm -hmm. So Kevin has every single advantage over everybody else doing audiophile records in the sense that he is producing that, you know, engineering, he's doing every aspect short of maybe some graphics and some mm -hmm. little bit of producing probably here and there, but all of the technical stuff he's doing, he has control over. It's going to mm -hmm. yield sonic results that are spectacular. I mean, I, there's a huge, I think it's tough to say, but I really truly think great things are uh, going to come his way with this label. Yeah. And I kind of yeah. think about it. I, I thought about it the other day. I'm like, you know, I can see, truly, and it is, I could see this becoming so big and so successful for him that I think it could affect his master. Now, maybe he mm -hmm. wouldn't say that's the case, but <laughs> I can definitely yeah. see that being an issue because it, yeah. it's going to spread. So, People are going to want to do this. this so, of, so, Mike, yeah. So, shapes and sounds. I don't know if you had access to a test pressing. No. before it came out but if you did or if you had a very early listening could you tell it was going to be the, the hit that it was so i had no access to it i found out you know i listened to it pretty much with everybody else there was a i had a lot of hope not even hope i kind of really was confident that this was going to be a good record because i know what he was capable of putting out because i've heard records that were cut by Kevin Gray and then done by 20 other people. So I knew where his ear was. Like I felt like I knew where his ear was and kind of what he is going for sonically. So because of that, I kind of felt like that would go all in, you know, that, that direction would go into recording. So I, I thought to myself, well, like if that's where his ear is, that's where his ear is going to be recording. And if that's the case, it's going to be real good. Then you hear about like, the effort he went into and in manufacturing his own gear and doing gear and kind of knocking off that Van Gelder studio in a sense. It's like his head was in the exact right place for every little aspect of this business. So looking at that, I thought to myself, like, this has got very little chance of not being really good. I just truly felt that way. And then I put it on and it was Oh, it was just such an experience because I thought it was really not only was it musically good. Now, was it Giant Steps or Love Supreme or Kind of Blue? No, but it was a very fun record to listen to and a record that I find li myself listening to more than once. And that's mm -hmm. like a good sign because some of the best reviewed records of the 50s and 60s aren't necessarily records that I listen to all the time. So when I got it and I started listening to it and then I found it myself listening to it more. And then I started in the store demoing it and showing people in the sound room or playing it on uh, the stereo. And then people are like, Oh, this is, what is this? This is fantastic. And then having that conversation and, you know, I could see really quick that it was, he had, you know, a home run on his hand from somebody who outside of California is not really well known. So I kind of thought, and then talking to him, knowing that he had big stars lined up, I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be great. That's why look, going back to that business aspect, I never really thought I had much of a chance, but I had to try. <laughs> so but, speaking of that business piece of it, when the next title, or when represses come out, when the next titles come out, are you, so are you basically holding the stock of that and then we'll distribute or how? Yeah. So that rather than U.S. And, and global. Yeah. Isn't that fantastic? Like Green Groove Record Store located in Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> is going to be rolling in pallets of these <laughs> records before anybody else has them. It's interesting. And man. It's, it's an honor for me. It really, truly is. And the fact that we were able to do this is, I mean, it was a big honor for me because, uh, 
you know, I felt like, you know, he's definitely trusting me to do that. I can do it because I don't have a track record of distributing anybody's records. This is the first. Mm -hmm. So he's yep. trusting that I'm capable of doing it. And I mean, it, it's a big honor because this is his baby. I mean, this record label is his baby. It's like 15, 20 year long dream of his. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of nervousness with that when you have that something like that for somebody in your hands. But really, truth be told, it's just a matter of boxing up records and sell them, you know, so <laughs> you're shipping them, which is what I do anyway. So I got to calm myself down every now and then be like, no, 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 you'll be fine. It's easy. This isn't a problem. Well, if uh, you, you, I was going to say, when are you going to take over distribution for all the record store day titles? No, I mean, I don't think so. Because <laughs> the problem with taking over distribute distribution for anything in particular is you got to handle all the back end problems that go with it. Yeah. Uh, this will be very low with problems because of how it's done and where it's done and how it, I mean, I could see that because I've sold enough of them to kind of get an idea. Mm -hmm. Man, I would never want to be on the other end of that with somebody like, and, and I really don't have any truth, any goals of being this massive conglomerate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 maybe we'll grow, we'll do things at a bigger level someday, but I don't want to be this uh, multifaceted conglomerate. I don't really want to have you know, what Chad's do, that type of thing. That's yeah. just, I did it in my previous career and it's not as fun as what I'm doing now. For mm -hmm. me, it is. I have a question. So we talked about the pandemic and your 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 uh, online shopping, you know, shipping and all that growing. What, you know, what percentage of your business is that? I mean, is it like overwhelmingly online versus what you sell in the store or is it more even? I, mean, I still do a good amount of business in the store, but it is... Uh, mostly online i mean it's definitely mostly online but i do a huge amount of business in the store but i'm also in a situation where unlike other parts of the country there's not a ton of record stores in phoenix mm -hmm. and there's like less than a dozen and if you take out a chain there's like five i mean yeah. there's very few mm -hmm. and that's in a city what is it phoenix is the fourth or fifth largest city in the country what, 5 million-ish people in Metro Phoenix? Oh, I don't know. Is that... You go to L.A., and I don't know, what's Metro L.A.? Maybe two, three, time, three times the size? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have 120 record stores. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're, the, I the have thing, advantage there. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's different, though, with your store compared to anyone I've ever been to is you have the stuff we want to buy. Yo, I have stock. Yeah, so, stock. And then, but there's so many stores around me that just won't stock audio file records you're like hey we'll order it for you i was like well dude i can just order it myself i don't want to necessarily have to call you every time a record's coming mm -hmm. out so we'll show up and buy it but they just won't it's, stock them I don't, I don't understand why i feel like they could they could do so much more business if they did but the problem hard is just, telling them that it's hard and i sense their pain because there's really very little money in it mm -hmm. you know if it, tone poet sells for 38.99 and they got to pay 32 dollars and it's got to sit on the shelf. It's like, how much capital do you want to tie up into it? Yeah, uh, it, it is difficult as an yeah. indie record store. It, and the, all of the bread and butter for almost every independent, independent record store is in used records. Sure. But yeah. oddly enough, yeah, I, I mean, went a different direction and started buying a lot of used records. But I'm telling you, there was a lot of years where I made absolutely no money. I mean, there was no money to be made. And I mean, it took years to get to where I am now. And it's hard for a lot of independent record stores who might not have had the background that I had mm -hmm. to do this because most people can't open a business and like uh, make no money for three years. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. One of my locals here, he was just complaining about the, the pure pleasure, the strategy stuff. He said it's outrageously expensive for me to get in the MSRP. I'm just not ordering them. Just if anybody really, really wants it, he will order, but he will not stop them. It's hard. I mean, it's, yeah. I, I would imagine it to be like to properly stock a really decent selection of rock and jazz and a little, little smattering of everything, probably a quarter of a million dollars to oh, tie up. And, yeah. and like most people that start record stores, like they grab their collection off their shelf and they start up a record store. So. <laughs> Most people don't have the ability to bridge that to a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment, and I mean, I didn't do that to start, but it was I spent years taking every spare nickel that I had from that store and just putting it back, mm -hmm. putting it back. And I mean, I went to work every day, 
I didn't have a day off for, I want to say, I worked seven days a week for maybe six years straight. Oh, wow. I mean, there was no time off. I guess theoretically Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, the days you had to be called Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter. But there was no days off. And it was not only that, it was going in every single day and taking every nickel you made and then putting it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tough to do for sure. That's not easy for a lot of stores to do. And I kind of had a head up. I had a little bit of advantage, too, because when I got going, you didn't have guys like our companies like Amazon. And they really hadn't taken hold yet. You know, vinyl wasn't really a thing for them yet. So for the most part, you still had to go online and either buy it from another record store or you had to go into a record store. Labels weren't selling everything direct. Artists weren't selling everything direct. And Amazon wasn't, you know selling everything direct mm -hmm. so i kind of had a little bit of advantage in that aspect i think that i didn't that have to with that until yeah. later on um just just going back uh i think you know one of the things that um we can see that you're doing is it seems like when opportunities come up that you take advantage so like the kevin gray relationship um and then also the wild times that you put out i think in uh last year 2022 you had it uh, cut by Bernie Grunman, pressed at RTI, stout and jackets, you know, uh, designed liner notes, all that stuff. And just the one question around that is that process where, you know, I'm sure that there were a lot of learnings, but getting that insight into kind of creating an audiophile record um, yourself with, you know, I'm sure, a team. But uh, were there, you know, were there any key learnings that you take when you speak with Chad or some of the other uh, reissue guys? So it was it was a fun experience. I felt like I I knew to be honest ex exactly what I wanted to do with that record uh, from the very beginning. I had no doubt in my mind, and so a buddy of mine approached me with it. And he goes, I'll "Give you a little backstory." He hands me a CD with like thirty tracks on it, and he goes, "What do you think of this?" And it was my buddy Johnny D who owns the rights to the record. And I start flipping through the tracks. And I'm like, oh, man, this is great. Listen to this. And I'm like, no, no, that's bulky. I don't like that. And we're going through it and we're listening to it. He goes, yeah. And he's telling me the story. This is, uh, I got this. I found this tape. And then I so listened to what was on it. It was one little reel. And then I found other reels. But, you know, he's going through his archive. And he found all these different tracks. It was never something that was meant to be an album. But he found all these little uh, multi-tracks. It was a, a smattering. It was direct to two track type stuff. It was four track. It was eight track. It was stuff on half inch reels, one inch reels, but like a couple of years worth of music that were just on these reels. And he found them and just said, I'm wanting to put an album out on this. And I kind of approached him and I said, you know what? We should do it this way. And this is a guy who's never the audio file presentation is the farthest thing from his mind. I said, no, John, I think that we could really do a good job with this. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but it was kind of hard getting it done because it took place essentially during COVID. Most of it did. But uh, it was a lot of work, frustrating to deal with uh, scheduling from mastering engineers to uh pressing time to getting the jackets done at Stoughton. I mean, it was difficult, but I kind of knew exactly what I wanted to do, to do. Patience was the only thing I had to learn during that whole experience. But I think the hardest thing that you have to deal with, I didn't have to deal with in that. And that is obtaining the actual permission to get it done. Mm. Like I knew ahead of time what I had. I was doing it with the guy who owned the music and had all these reel to reels. So I... <laughs> If I didn't have that, and it was something, a project that I was starting from scratch, I think the hardest part of doing a, a reissue nowadays is that licensing the beginning aspect. I think everybody at this point in time, even casual people watching, kind of know how to make a good record. It's not rocket science. Uh, if you get the master tape, you cut it directly from the tape. You have one of the top guys do it, whether it's like Kevin Burney, Ryan Smith. Uh, you have it pressed at places like Sony Japan, QRP. Uh, RTI, maybe Palace, yeah. Optimal, and uh, you put a good jacket on, a Stoughton style tip on jacket. Like that's the formula. Yep. It's really not rocket science, but 
getting the license nowadays is what's difficult. And well, the major all figured out the formula. <laughs> what's that? I mean, the major co corporations have figured out the formula. I mean, yeah, the home boats were probably the first, and now they're all just starting to do it. So here's another story I don't think I've ever told. So I'm at the Capitol Record Fair in 2015. It was the coolest experience ever. They're like, we're going to start doing record shows at the Capitol Tower. They used to have like a swap meet, I guess, in the 70s at the Capitol Tower. I get a phone call from the organizer. This was 2015. Hey, do you want to come and sell records in the parking lot of the tower? I'm like, yes, I do. We're going to have tours. You're going to be able to go into the tower and go into the mastering rooms and possibly see my head explode. Wow, that's so amazing. So I, you get, uh, did you go to Studio A and see like all the Sinatra photos and all that stuff? We you walked were? by it and I like saw it in the window. But luckily, okay. I was able to go to some of their. I went to. They did this. So, I think somebody was recording in it, so we couldn't go into it. Mm. But I, they did this thing where they actually took uh, a copy of a Blue Note tape, and they were cutting lacquers in there. And you could pay to like do, go to the Capitol Tower, sit in the mastering room while they cut a lacquer, and then act afterwards they auctioned these lacquers off for charity, and. Uh, subsequently actually I, I won every single one of those <laughs> so i'm sitting in the auction i bid up every single one i won every single one of those test press those lacquers uh just because i they were going for like nothing they were going for like 50 60 bucks don was autographed them all but the reason i mentioned the stories there was a don was was sitting there they had different dealers there but they had don was sitting there at the blue note tent and i talked to don for like an hour and a half and one of the things we had talked about was Music Matters. And Don just looks at me and he goes, I just can't figure it out. He goes, whatever they do, it is the best. Those records are unbelievable. Because at the time, they had the 75th anniversaries. And I think they knew that the 75th stuff just wasn't that good. It wasn't well received. The, they got no praise. They got no love in the audiophile community. And they just knew it. And Don was, he goes, I, I just don't know. It's just, you know what they're doing over there is just, it's fantastic. And so he had the most praise for the music matter stuff. And I had talked to him, but he, at that time too, was, I want it to be any which way possible. I want the audio files to get what they want. I got the, want the people that can't afford that to buy their stuff. I want digital. I want streaming. I want downloads. I want it every which way possible. And that was kind of, I think probably close to when he took over. So he's had that mindset from the beginning, but it was funny when I had that conversation, I knew it in the back of my mind. And then a couple of years later, it's Joe's left Music Matters. He's going to work for them. And, it's, and I thought back on that conversation. It's like, well, uh, I think Don figured out what to do at this point. Yeah. He's we just go hire the guy that does it. And <laughs> subsequently, we have tone poets. But uh, that was a cool experience. Actually, Kevin Gray and Bernie were there. They gave a seminar at that event. Oh. But uh, I would wonder what an event like that would be as far as it, it was not really well attended. It lasted two years and then they never did it again. I wonder how attended something like that would be now. But uh, it would be a madhouse. It would be crazy. But what a fun experience to be able to uh, to do that. And yeah, I'm, they got rid of the mastering rooms now at Capitol. There are no more mastering rooms. So I got to be there at the tail end because they kind yeah. of realized like, look, we could just hire Kevin to do it. And that's what everybody wants, anyways. Yeah, we have these rooms here, but that was a, that was an experience. Wow, that's awesome. All right, uh, so we did request uh, that you bring some records since you have uh, what looks to be one of the most impressive collections in North America. If there's if there's any titles that you want to show and talk about um, for fun. Yeah, I grabbed a few things. Okay, cool. So, I grabbed a few records. So a lot of the records in my collection are records that I like, but so many of them have sentimental attachment for me because I can remember where... I mean, that's the thing about vinyl in general is I remember like when I got those records. And this first record I'm going to show you is not even a jazz record. And I maybe I've showed this once upon a time. This is a Dark Horse test pressing, George Harrison's label. And it's of a band. I don't even know the band. The band is irrelevant because they just are. 
but there's this test pressing and I got this in George Benson's collection. Oh, wow. oh cool. And it says uh, for George Benson from George Harrison. Oh, wow. So that's autographed by George Harrison. That's his handwriting. So wow. this is a record that was from George's label and given to George Benson. And it was that's in incredible. his collection. So I look at this record and so it like takes me back to the time of buying George Benson's record collection. So and finding this and digging through a box and like looking at this and I've got a you know, it just you know it's one of those moments where you're sitting there and you're like looking at this record and it's just like wow how awesome is this it's it's everything you kind of want in a record it's Beatles it's me buying George's records it's it was just so for me this is just such a it's a special piece no for sure uh yeah. so you know that's that's one thing that's amazing but it brings me back to when you know and it gets me thinking about when i bought the collection and kind of what that experience is you know and a lot of times when i pull records off of my shelf i have that like you know things you forgot about but you'll find that record and you're like oh man and then it, like all comes rushing back all the memories and that next record is uh, another one of those times. So I'll tell you the backstory. I get a phone call from a lady. This is like right when I opened up the shop, maybe 2015. And it's like the record. It is the it is a phone call as a dealer you always want to hear. She, I'm talking. She's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm in the far west side. I got a record collection. Do you travel?" I'm like, "Yeah, but you know, can you tell me a little bit about the collection?" And she's well, I don't really know what's in it, but it's my husband's collection. And his grandfather, he worked for Columbia and he was a big, big time a lawyer. But a lot of the collection is like promo stuff and, you know, stuff that was given to him. And so a lot of it's like not for sale, but it's a lot of stuff. I don't know if there's a lot of market for it because it's a lot of like stuff I've never really heard of, you know, like really like obscure jazz artists. Yes. <laughs> okay. She goes, but you know, he was given all this stuff. So, I mean, he never really played it. So, I mean, I, you know, it's obscure oh jazz artists, it's stuff he never played. I don't know if anybody cares. You know, there's some Bob Marley in it, though, too. And I'm like, so let's talk about that obscure jazz stuff. And she just starts <laughs> naming some stuff off. I'm like, I would love to come to your house right away. When are you available? <laughs> go, when are you available? I'm like, well, I mean, I, you're 45 minutes away. So, it's going to take me at least 48 minutes to get there. Uh, you tell me when you're available. <laughs> so I go there. This thing was like the next day. I walk in and it was like, I don't, to this day, I don't know who the guy was, but there's a picture of his grandfather, like shaking hands with like Michael Jackson and like uh, Jesse Jackson's in the photo and like, I'm like looking at this photo and maybe it was like Michael Jackson, Jesse Jackson was in the photo. His grandfather was in the photo and like, it was like earth, wind and fire in the background or something, something bizarre. And I'm like, Oh my God, who is this guy? So I go in the room and all these records are laid out on the floor and I just start going through this collection. And this is one of the records from that collection. And this is a uh, Lyman Woodard organization on Strata. Yeah, oh, just wow. being reissued on Strata. And he had two copies of these, and they, they were sealed. Wow. And mine is still in the shrink. And I'm just like looking at it. In the shrink? No, it was sealed. I opened it. Sealed. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's in the shrink now, but he had two copies of it. I opened the first one and it had a piece of paper embedded in it because they were not known for being the best presents. Right. So, I opened the second copy and I kept that one. I sold the other one. But there was maybe 15 records, 10 to 15 records on Strata in this collection. There was like avant-garde stuff, the pyramids. There was a ton of avant-garde stuff. And I kept most of it. But stuff got sold, like the second copy of this. But this is the kind of, if it's not that hard bop era, uh, yeah. I mean, this is kind of the stuff that I really did. The yeah. funky you know, the bass work on the opening track on this is just fantastic. And it's a record that I truly enjoy. But then again, 
it's sentimental because I pull it out and I just have all these flashbacks. And not only getting the collection, but uh, just everything that was involved in getting the collection. So that's number two. Real nice. quick, how, how many collections do you have to go through to find a gem? <laughs> so I'm lucky in the sense that most record stores are not capable of buying, say, a $100,000 collection. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky in the sense that I have the ability to do that. People trust me and they'll contact me to sell me the, the high dollar, well curated collections. I mean, there's only X amount of dealers in the world that get access to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them at this point. And when you're going through a collection that costs a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, there's a lot of gems. They're just this because I mean, you wouldn't pay that much if there wasn't. Right. But the amount of people coming in, almost everybody that comes in, you'll go through 50 collections before you find something that's like impresses me. You know, there's a lot of, but that's to be honest, the meat and potatoes, that's the stuff that keeps record stores going. I'm never disappointed when I see clean copies of rumors and clean copies of the cars records and talking heads. It's great. I mean, it's not something that I need and it doesn't personally get me excited. Uh, but every now and then, you know, I'll get a box of records and it'll be nothing but like an older guy bringing in a bunch of records and it's like Lawrence Welk and a bunch of just schmaltz. And then he'll have it like a beautiful six eye of kind of blue. And it's like, Oh man, that's exciting. But those are really few and far between. It's not like it, not very common. Yeah. I do like, um, sometimes you'll live stream, you'll like go in, into your like storage area, grab a box and mm -hmm. just crack it open. You're like, I think this is a jazz box and start like just pulling out like, you know, like a stack of blue notes and just start going through them. I could watch that for like hours. Well, there was a point in time during the pandemic that I was, I'm still buying collections, but there was like a mad rush to try to sell stuff off because there was a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I had just, I kept buying them and I would just stack them in the back of the store. I was still, my dining room had 500 U-Haul boxes in it. My living room, my storage room, my garage. I mean, I was just packing collections I mean, like crazy. And I would, whatever it was, $50,000 collection, it would be a hundred boxes. I would get three or four or five boxes in starting to process it. And then I bought the next $50,000 collection and set it on top of that one. So... <laughs> I, I just I accumulated so much stuff during that amount of time that yeah, I was just pulling boxes off of the pile in the warehouse and shocked myself. I was actually I did it the other day in the store and I was shocked at some of the stuff I found that I forgot was there. Yeah. One of my favorite things to do. It doesn't matter how many records you have or how long you've been doing this, whether it's a week or 20 years. There is a huge adrenaline rush, and there's an, a lot of a lot of exhilaration, you know, for finding that thing that you know nobody else found before you. Mm -hmm. You know, I could buy a rare record ten times over if I want, but that's not the point. When you find it, and you are the one who found it, and you unearthed it, and it was in somebody's shed, and then it now like that that is a different experience, and that's that's truly something that's fun to do. And it never gets old. That adrenaline rush never gets old. And my wife looks at me like I'm crazy because I'll pull something out and it's like a thousand dollar record. And it's, you don't have that already. <laughs> oh, I do. What's the problem? It's like, cause I found it. Look, it's here. It's, it's hard to explain, but if you found that item and you know what I'm talking about, that never gets lost on anybody in any particular stage of collecting. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I go I go to estate sales and stuff, and it's like ninety nine point nine percent garbage. You know, Lawrence Welk, just all you know, hymns, all that shit. But then you'll find like one record that's worth fifty bucks, and I get super excited. You know, <laughs> but the thing is, it like it'll live with you. And I mean, I got records that I've had for twenty years, and like I remember, I could never think about the moment now to tell you. But if I had that record in my hand, I could remember everything about that time, and it's just. I don't know, as you get, I'm not, I feel like I'm getting old. I know a lot of people, I, I turned 40 the other day. So I feel like I'm getting older. <laughs> but it's nice to kind of like have that in your hand and go back mentally and have that fond memory of that time. So, I mean, that's kind of like an added bonus to everything else that goes along with buying records. Yep. That sentimental attachment. 
yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to, I'll show this. This is my, uh, this is my, I've got maybe 30 versions of this record, but, uh, and you know, I've got, this is the first true first pressing, double deep groove, no register trademark. And I mean, I've got second, third, fourth, bunch of label variations. I might have 50 pressings of this because it's the record that got me going. But yeah. uh, I figured I'd show it because it is the record that got me into jazz. And uh, it was even at a time when I could get my wife to listen to it and she would sit in the living room and kind of put up with it. Now she refuses to listen to any jazz. But I remember this very record listening to repetitively. So wh when did you, how did you get that particular pressing? This was on eBay. I want to say I got this maybe around 2000. And I'm going to say maybe I paid 50, 60 bucks for this record. Man, what's that go for now? Oh, maybe at least a grand, or maybe more. I mean, it, it was one of, there was records that for a lot of years weren't worth a ton of money. This was one of them. Blue Train was one of them. Blue Train was a very common record with, you know, collecting jazz for a lot of years. Maybe that true first, first variation with the uh, New York 23 that comes at the end of the label. Maybe that was a very difficult record to find, but it was never like the Holy Blue Note jazz record. It was always mm -hmm. Hank Mobley's Sextet. That was the big money record. Mm -hmm. It's funny to see how that's kind of evolved to where that's still a really desirable record, but it seems like oh, yeah. the big ones now are True Blue. Again, a record that wasn't really expensive like it is now 15 years ago. And uh, that Coltrane record, it's not because it's the rarest record, it's just because how many people now are looking for it. Mm -hmm. But I think I paid maybe a hundred bucks for this record. Yeah, it's amazing. But, uh, yeah, it's crazy. My, my, that was my great. Oh, sorry, please, please. No, my great is the Yuta hip. That's the one I. How 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 often does this show show up? The Yuta hip with Zoot Sims with the green cover. Yeah, yeah. So I've never, I've never actually seen that in a record store, in a show, or in my store in person. I mean. Yeah. That, those are the kind of records that, like, you know, you got to buy online. You got to go to like. Those are records that you almost. I mean, in Arizona, anyways. Now, maybe there's parts of New Jersey where they're, they're a little bit more common. Although I doubt it. But that's a, that's a very difficult record. I found the Judah Hip stuff, is is, yeah. is hard to find. I, I think the last one was Carolina, so of like three thousand. Yeah. Yeah. And they helped you to buy it, Felipe. No, I, I need to. I need to pull more. I need to pull more teeth for that. I feel yeah. like she has those two Hickory House records that I think are fifteen hundreds, mm -hmm. and those like, I don't think have been re. I mean, there's probably Japanese pressings, but I don't know if they've ever been reissued in the United States. So those are super hard records. Maybe a future tone poet. That'd be nice. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Let me show you another one. This actually came into the store. This is actually my favorite Sonny Rollins record. Mm -hmm. This is cool. just a beautiful. I mean, when this came into my store, I thought this thing was fake because I mean, it just looked absolutely perfect. My favorite Sunny, one of my favorite jazz records too. It's just a fun record, and uh, the guy that brought it into me, he had like six records, and uh, it was really bizarre. So he has like this. He had like a Guns and Roses lies, and. He thought like every record was like 400 bucks, and a lot of them he brought me in were just like 20 to 100 records. Mm -hmm. And I remember just thinking to myself, like, how in the world am I going to get this record? Like, I knew what I was getting into going into this thing, and I probably overpaid. I think at the time, I maybe paid him like 350, 400 bucks for this as a store. And mm -hmm. this was like seven, eight years ago, or it was definitely overpaid at the time. But uh, I, this was the record I ended up getting from him. And he's like, I got a bunch of great records, I'll bring it back. He never did. But mm -hmm. uh, one of the nicest copies of my favorite Sonny Rollins record. And I mean, I have everything that is of significance or like a value, you know, but it's like to me, this is the record that I'm the most attached with because of the way I got it. And also it's my favorite record. You, know, you don't get the same attachment when you're just clicking a button on eBay. Although, I mean, you get enjoyability out of it when you mm -hmm. you uh, when you when it comes in the mail. But uh yeah, what a great record. And, it, you know, the cover's great, too, because who knows where he shot that. It's probably California, but yeah, this could be uh, down the street from me here in Phoenix. True. <laughs> uh, what did you think about the box they just put out? Did you listen to it? 
I listened to it in the store one time, and I'm very behind on actually what I've got to listen to. Uh, I'll blame my wife on that because she doesn't let me play jazz records in the store. So I have to either do it at home, which I'm not home a ton, or I have to do it on Saturday when she's not there. So I try to like pack in as much stuff as possible on Saturday. If you come to the in-groove on Saturday, you probably listen to a lot of jazz records. But uh, yeah, it kind of puts her in a real bad mood. I haven't figured out how to crack that out of her, but uh, it's not getting better. It's, it's getting worse. If you figure it out, let me know. Yeah, it's not working. And it, like at first she would just like, oh, I don't want to listen to this. Now she like physically gets upset, like, yeah, yeah turn it off. I'm gonna get smacked. So, <laughs> uh, I am behind on listening, but also I'm behind on listening because there is so much stuff coming out now and great stuff coming out. And then, like, in conjunction with the records that I'm buying, yeah. mm-hmm. so, so I've got like great grail type of stuff coming in that I purchased from auction sites or heritage or whatever the case might be. And it's like I'm tagging that in with contemporaries and. Not only that, I mean, I listen to a lot of stuff in a lot of different genres. Mm-hmm. So I listened to it in the store. It sounded really good. Bernie was the right choice for that particular label. He really was. For sure. Uh, Did so you, in Heritage, there was an auction I saw months back. It was, I think it was Leonard Feather's personal collection. Was that Heritage that was selling that? Did you hear about that? I think it was Leonard Feather. It might not have been Leonard Feather. It was one of the critics, though. But he had, they had like. Um, was that Carolina like, Soul that got that? Maybe. It may have been, but it was. It might have been Heritage. I don't know. They're working through a really big collection now. That's something obscene. That's crazy. Yeah, there was like Blue Note test pressings that were given to him as a critic and stuff. Yeah, there was like five copies so far of uh, Triple Threat, like Rolling Curve. Very an impossible record to have. And it's like every there's like new one. There's like a different one in every single auction that they have. But uh, yeah, but test pressing. So I've been kind of like buying some of that stuff kind of fill in pieces and that's mm-hmm. kind of fun so you got to pick it choose the stuff you listen to but i definitely listen to that record it, it was a love that sonny rollins record absolutely and one more avant-garde record i figured i'd grab something that i truly love and i play a lot it's one of these records that i truly do play a ton of times and it's not very expensive uh and I have a lot of memories as well with this one when I played, and that is Alice Coltrane's Eternity. This is actually my favorite mm-hmm. Alice Coltrane record, and probably, if not her cheapest, one of her cheapest records to buy on mm-hmm. the secondary market. But the Los Cabellos is my favorite track on this album, and it's like, for mm-hmm. me, it's the perfect perfect track. I actually prefer, sacrilege to probably say this, but I prefer Alice over later era Coltrane, John Coltrane stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I liked her output more at this point in time, mm-hmm. you know, the late sixties and seventies. Like her stuff was fantastic, and this album is just killer. It kind of goes through different types of moods, from just really light, like meditative, meditative heart playing, like you feel like you could be getting a massage to, to just the most crazy, spastic, hopped up organ playing. I mean, it's really all over the map as far as uh, the music. But every time I grab it now, it reminds me I bought Ed Michelle, the producer of this record's record collection. And I actually got the safety tape to this, the original track safety oh, mask right. of this. Coincidentally, it happened to be in that collection. It just happened to be my favorite Alice Coltrane record. But this is a record that I play a lot and I listen to a lot. And uh, again, that other kind of style of jazz i collect that somewhat mm-hmm. funky spiritual avant-garde stuff in conjunction with all the what is now extremely rare and expensive hard bop yeah. cool i'll check that yeah. out have you not heard that record i haven't um so mm-hmm. i'm sure it will probably sell a few copies when this video goes live so it's odd it's so crazy so it's been my favorite alice coltrane for, record for the longest time so I'm in, in my favorite track on that album, right? So I'm in, went to uh, went to Manhattan a year and a half ago, went to see uh, her son, Robbie, play at the Village Vanguard. And he's playing some of his stuff, some of his father's stuff, some of Alice's stuff throughout all of his sets. You know, I kind of have seen kind of some of the set lists he's performed in the past. 
but it just so happened the one show that I went to, we actually played that track. I was so blown away. Uh, what were the odds to hear Robbie play my favorite track off of my favorite Alice Coltrane record? That was a that was a cool experience. It makes me think one day I might end up retiring in a jazz capital as opposed to Phoenix. I don't know. We'll see. Where do you see the future of vinyl? You think it's, it's came back to stay? Yeah, I think How it's in a healthier. You see our store in 20 years. I think it's in a healthier place than where it was a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, I don't think was very sustainable for the business model. I think it turned a lot of people off. At fun, at the beginning, it was fun, and buying a record that immediately tripled and quadrupled and making all that free cash was great for a lot of people. And they, you know what I mean. That was mm -hmm. never sustainable. And I think that vinyl in general is in a better place now than it was throughout the pandemic and even pre-pandemic. So I really, although the numbers probably aren't the same and I'm not making as much as I did say during the pandemic, I think we're now in a better place and a place that can be built on and grow. Uh, records need to be in print. They need to be available for an X amount of time to give people the opportunity to say maybe they need to wait till their next paycheck to buy a record that needs to be an option for people and it's becoming that again we still have these like little anomalies things that sell out too quick but i think we're still going through an adjustment numbers are still having to come down you know the uhqr is of thirty thousand. i don't know if that's feasible uh but that will change one step's coming down in quantity that will change and the market will kind of rebalance. But I think we're in a good place, and I think it's here to stay and progressively get better because the support for it has gotten better. It's easier to get good sound and quality turntables. You know, turntable competition has breeded uh, better gear. So we've got better gear that's more affordable out in the market. Uh, Manufacturers are now starting to put out quality stuff and focus on that. For the most part, every label has a division that's in tune with putting out quality stuff. I mean, I think everything is going in the right direction. And I, I, I think that's good for the industry. Plus, you got Taylor Swift, who yes. brings well, in people to start. Brings up a million of, millions of customers into record stores. That's <laughs> unbelievable. And as long as she's pumping out albums and re-recordings of albums, uh, records are here to stay. But, are, are, uh, are the pop titles high quality now, or, or is that a problem? Some of them are. There's some artists that just have high quality records just like right from the jump. There's some, like whether it's, it doesn't matter what, it could be pop, it could be, there's just certain artists that I think almost some of these guys are, you know, some of these artists are audiophiles to where they'll put out high quality stuff. Uh, some of it's not, but Taylor's stuff is actually generally really good. Like, uh, it's, it's all Ryan Smith. Yeah, for the amount of Taylor Swift records I have sold in conjunction with how many I have taken back, there's some audiophile records that aren't running those same numbers. You know what I mean? As mm -hmm. far as return rate. So some artists truly do care about their fans and the music and the quality of music they put out as far as product you know, presentation goes. Uh, but I think it's here to stay because, I mean, I see it. It's funny. I go online and I talk on YouTube, and it really truly is to a totally different audience than uh, comes in the store. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's like I lead a double life. Oh, it's I did want to ask, do, do people come in from, like, out of state or just out of the area, recognize you, or come to your store because they know you from YouTube? And, you know, how, how has that um, affected kind of some of the, the people that come in? uh no I, that happens a lot we're like a tourist destination for sure <laughs> that's like every like tell me like if you go to new york city you're going to go to like the jazz record center right yeah for sure you're going to do that but if you come to phoenix and you buy records there's a good chance you're going to come to the in group so we're definitely a tourist <laughs> trends we're definitely a <laughs> tourist destination at this point kind of joke about it and in the store a lot i'm like you know i tell you about the amount of people that come to phoenix to see us I, you know the governor's gonna have to put us on the welcome to arizona sign any day now it's gonna come but uh there is a lot of vinyl tourism and we get it there is i mean i know it's that's the case when i go out of town 
vinyl addicts, record termites like to go to other record stores in other cities. And we're pretty well known, so they do the same thing. Uh, some of the locals, I think they liked it better before all of this <laughs> because I would still be buying all these great collections. They just didn't have to compete with as many people. Mm -hmm. I wish sometimes I had a camera like go to see what kind of goes on behind the scenes. Because, you know, somebody will come in and they're like, oh, my your channel's great, fantastic. Can I get a, can I get, can we take a photo? And then I'll look over in the distance and it's like my wife is just doing this and she's like <laughs> rolling her eyes and she's like, this is ridiculous. This is, what, what's going on? And she'll shout, stop it. You're making his head big. <laughs> just so it's an interesting people coming in and chatting. And it, it's definitely, it's unique. But at the same token, you know, I'll get locals who have come in there for like six, seven, eight months. I've seen these people a hundred times. And they'll see me taking a picture with something. Like, Why'd you take a picture with that guy? Who was it? <laughs> like, no, no, they were taking a picture with me. They're like, "Why?" <laughs> so, it really is a double kind of thing going on. There is tons of locals who truly don't pay attention to YouTube, the VC. They have no clue what's going on. And then there's a huge amount of audience that is into that. But what makes it the reason I brought it up going back to the original question that Felipe had was that crowd is large. It's young. They're into buying records and it's getting bigger. That crowd is getting bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just hope the labels kind of nurture that and they don't take advantage mm -hmm. and don't go for that That's... fast buck by putting out low quality trash because it grates mm -hmm. on people. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this, that customer with his scratch little Wayne record, if that happens to him a lot, he's not going to be continually buying records. Mm -hmm. So hopefully these labels aren't short sighted like they have been in the past. And they do a service to their customers by putting out decent quality stuff mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not the nineties anymore. When I started collecting, yeah. I don't have to buy records and neither does anybody else. We could just get everything that's ever been recording for the most part on our cell phone. So, yeah hopefully that customer is nurtured and taken care of because they are the future of vinyl yeah. what they want so, is the future of this hobby so moving from a hobby to a consumption media pretty much it is if you expose people to good quality recordings on good gear it and somebody cares about music now some people just truly don't some people music is just stuff to vacuum their living room to but for somebody who is into it, that cares about it, you expose them to everything done right. They will never unhear it and they'll never be able to forget it and get it out of their mind. You got them hooked for life. You know, it's you don't know if you don't know. But once you do, yeah. your wallet's in trouble. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's say that again. Yeah. As you all guys right. all know. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for stopping by, Mike. This was really fun. You're welcome. Uh, so cool. you, uh, we're going to link to your YouTube channel. I'm sure probably 100% of people that subscribe to us are already subscribed to you. But if you don't, make sure to follow Mike. I think every Thursday morning you do the new arrivals, which is a cool way to see what's coming out. Mm -hmm. um, you also do, I think you do like a monthly live stream um, with Angel. Yeah, right? I do kind of a, my thought for that was like the behind the scenes of a husband and wife record store owner. <laughs> you know, that, so we do that. And do then the live streams. You do, yeah. I mean, and then there's everything in between. You do like record store day titles that you unbox and show everyone. You show new arrivals that you think are cool. So um, definitely sub up. It's a great channel. And yeah. if you're out in Phoenix, go uh, say hi to Mike. And then also uh, check out theingroup.com. Um, for people watching, thanks for uh, for checking this out. Thanks so much uh, for watching. Remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment. Let us know what you liked about this. Any thoughts? Any questions? Um, it'd be fun to hear everyone's thoughts here. Um, any final thoughts? No, just thanks for joining us, man. It's been thanks, fun. Everybody. Thank you so much for coming, Mike. It was, was amazing, delightful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Floyd. Appreciate it. It's been fun. All right. See you, everyone.